what I want to do is break these axes instead of many uh, axes, which would make this talk very boring and hard to follow. I'm going to break it down into two pieces. The first category is the bread and butter of the web. Uh, how fast the user gets something meaningful after they tap on a link to your site with a cold cache. So the first time they click on a link from Google, they come to your site, how fast they get uh, that, how fast they get that content. So um, download, downloading fast. And in addition to downloading fast, we also want things to render fast. And uh, in addition to downloading and rendering fast, we also want it to happen even on slow networks, right? So you can probably make something download very fast if you have a fast network. That should be obvious. If you have a fast network, downloading will be fast. Um, but more and more, we're, try we're dealing with uh, slow networks. Um, the second category is actually a place where the web has traditionally struggled um, keeping the app nice and responsive to use once it's up and running. Um, and that, what I mean by that is once you click on something, it updates very quickly, uh, maintains 60 FPS where that matters. So that's things like scrolling, right? When you scroll, you don't want to feel jank. You don't want to feel like it's breaking up as you scroll. And just like we care about things being lightweight and fast and, and getting up and running quickly on slow networks, we care about things being responsive um, and updating quickly, even on, app, on things with a slow CPU. Uh, usually, these two columns are intention. Um, starting fast usually means that a bare minimum of both code and work has to be done during the initial render. But staying fast actually requires being smart about how we update the DOM. And usually, the smarter we want to be, the more code we have to load and the more we have to keep track of during the initial render. Right? So we, uh, we want to make the initial render as fast as possible, which means getting as much as possible out of that path. But at the same time, in order to make things fast to update, we need to keep track of what we did the first time around. And that's just a tricky thing to do, um, to do, in a, to do together. Um, so games do a really great job with responsiveness. You get really incredibly immersive experiences running on modern consoles and even mobile devices without, with hardly a hiccup. Um, I play some games on my mobile phones. And once I'm getting up and running, usually it's pretty quick, as long as it's a modern mobile phone. However, uh, it comes at a cost. Um, the dreaded loading screen, for those of you who, who play video games. Um, in order th to keep things running quickly, once you start playing, what games do is they subject their users to extremely long loading times. Sometimes people need to wait literally minutes of loading time to keep things smooth. When I was Googling um, for this image, I found people on Reddit saying, I have waited literally minutes. And people are ah, just keep waiting. It's probably fine. Um, so basically, what games are doing is they know that they can ex expect their users to wait for a very, very long period of time in order to get things going. Um, and in exchange for that, they make things very responsive once things are up and running. Um, on the flip side, what the web is focused on is getting content on the screen as fast as possible. Um, on a desktop, forget about minutes. If you don't get the content up in a matter of seconds, your users are going to leave. And as Alex Russell said here, um, he works at, at Google on web standards and Chrome. Um, he said, the web superpower is that it's so good at this kind of ephemeral usage. right? So we have uh, ephemeral use is a main use case of the web. It's actually a very unique thing about the web. Um, and while users of native apps are willing to tolerate literally minutes of initial installation, as Alex said here, uh, he said, you, uh, React Native and Cordova spots you first run via heavyweight install step, um, web applications actually don't have that luxury. And in addition to web applications normally not having that luxury, the kind that we may have written 10 years ago, the situation is actually getting worse, um, not better, in emerging markets, which provide a sort of anti-Moore's law effect. Um, what's happening is that the internet and computing is, are, is expanding into more and more parts of the world. Maybe someday it will be 100% of the world. But every time we expand into a new area, those new users have worse connectivity and slower devices than the existing users. Right? So if we want to reach those users without giving up on building the ki kind of ambitious products we want to build on the web, we actually need to find ways to do more with less. Um, and it goes without saying that slow connectivity isn't just a problem for emerging markets. Every time you drive into a tunnel or take the subway or leave a major urban area, um, you have to deal with the same kinds of constraints. Uh, millions of people in the United States buy phones every year that have very limited CPU capacity um, and sometimes uh, poor network connectivity. They, there's many places in the country uh, with that problem. So um, bottom line, the issues of slow connectivity and limited CPU capacity aren't going anywhere for a long time. We're going to continue to expand the internet and um, accessibility to more and more places. But there's always a next frontier that's going to have slower devices, slower connectivity. And that's just going to be happening for the foreseeable future um, until we fully, uh, until and unless we fully coat the entire world with very fast internet and very fast devices, we're going to have 
a number of people in the world who, have, who need to deal with these, these constraints. Um, and I, 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 the reason I brought up the stuff about um, going into a tunnel or whatever is that I, I think it may be the case that we never try to solve that problem. It could be that there are some places uh, you go into a cave, there's some suburban or rural areas that we just never worry that hard about making um, wireless connectivity fast. I don't, I don't know whether we will or not. But it's certainly a long way off before we even know the answer to that question. So for the foreseeable future, if we want to be building good applications that work for a lot of people, we have to deal with these problems. And frankly, we're not going to be able to ask web developers to shoulder this burden on their own. Um, web application development, as I said before, is already extremely challenging. Uh, most developers, including me, don't have a lot of time to be thinking about pr applying performance incantations on top of all the other things that you have to be doing day in and day out. Um, like what I basically am doing is adding features to a product. I work really hard to, to add features. I work really hard to make them good. Um, but on top, between having to you know, know CSS and uh, get the JavaScript to work in the first place and think about all the, the nitty gritty details about the design, work with designers, that's basically my entire day. I don't really have a lot of time to be thinking about all these other additional things. So um, if we want to build applications, so, so what most people do is they just scale down their ambition. But like I said, I'm not that kind of person. Um, if we want to build applications that are uh, ambitious and accessible at the same time, we actually need to find ways to have tools that can achieve good performance by default. So we need to have tools that are fast without asking the users to do a lot of work to make things be fast. And maybe at this point, you, uh, you might be asking, is that even possible? Um, as we saw, Games achieve runtime responsiveness by, maker, by making users wait forever um, as they load. And native applications achieve runtime responsiveness by making users wait literally minutes for the initial installation. So maybe there's not much we can do to be responsive to get the, um, to make things feel good once they're running at the same time as we get things on the page. Maybe that's just the price we have to pay for being the web. We have to take the fast content side and give up on the nice app side. Um, but maybe there is something that we can do to achieve them, um, to achieve that goal without giving up the, the superpower. And basically, that leads into the point of the, the talk here, which is that the solution, in my view, is to compile away the runtime. So um, the programmer has to be able to have all the tools. If you think about like what a programmer has access to when they write um, using Cocoa or Android Studio, there's a lot of stuff going on in those and those programming models, but you don't have to actually, every application doesn't have to include them, although they could probably get away with it if they had to. Um, we, we neither have the Cocoa runtime, nor can we get away with shipping it. So we need to find ways of um, having a very robust programming model that's fast by default, but also compiles away uh, at compile time. And in order to accomplish those twin goals of responsiveness and small payloads, this is something we've been thinking about for a very long time, we built a thing called a rendering engine called the Glimmer VM. Um, and yes, the Glimmer uses both a compiler and a VM architecture to achieve its performance goals, like I said earlier, and we'll see why soon. Um, first, just what is Glimmer for people who didn't already know? Um, Glimmer is the rendering engine that's used inside of Ember. Um, it's actually Ember's uh, third rendering engine, but Ember's template syntax has remained largely compatible the, the entire time as we've improved the infrastructure. Um, Ember is meant to be used for full-fledged applications, and one thing that happened as we continued to improve the rendering engine and people got more and more excited about the rendering engine and maybe less and less excited about Ember, um, <laughs> people uh, wanted to use Glimmer in more context, more standalone context. So um, last year, we released a thing called Glimmer.js, which is basically a standalone version of just a rendering engine that you can use in more places um, without, without having to bring along the entire Ember. Um, our mission for that project is eventually that you can NPM your way from Glimmer.js to Ember, and that's still something that we're actively working on. Um, so uh, additionally, Glimmer.js is still pre-1.0, but um, the thing that is really great about Glimmer.js existing is that it allowed us to experiment with basically everything else that's in the rest of my talk, right? So because Ember has such, very strong, has such strong compatibility requirements, we don't have as much room to maneuver in terms of experimenting um, with users' applications, uh, but Glimmer.js allowed us to have a sort of end-to-end -end story that let us experiment with a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so, getting a little bit into the technical details here, here's an example of a Glimmer.js component. Um, Glimmer.js has a really nice modern and minimal, minimalist component API. Um, you don't have to mess around with observers or bindings or set state or anything. You just tell us which properties might change with the track decorator, and anytime you change that property using normal JavaScript syntax, we will update the DOM for you. Um, Glimmer uses handlebars templates, which is the thing on the left side, 
to describe each component's DOM output. So if you're familiar with React, uh, a template is basically the same thing as a render function in React. Now, a lot of people want to tell you that templates are fundamentally less powerful. They're like training wheels until you reach level 19 enlightenment of doing everything in JavaScript. Um, but if rendering costs dominate the performance of most web applications, doesn't it make sense to have a language that's designed to optimize for that? And that's basically what Handlebars and Glimmer are. Um, the key thing to understand about Glimmer, the key insight of Glimmer, is that Handlebars as a, a language is not just a templating engine, it's a declarative functional programming language for building and updating the DOM. Um, it wasn't that when I made Handlebars in the first place um, in 2009, I think, but somewhere along the way, it, it changed from being a string concatenation engine to a declarative functional programming language for building and updating DOM. Um, in this sense, it has more in common with something like Elm than the string concatenation libraries people usually think about when they think about templates. Um, so what happens if we view Glimmer through the lens of a functional programming language specialized for producing and updating DOM? Let's take a look at the high-level architecture. Um, the first thing to note is that it's quite different from what most people think of when they think of a JavaScript library. Uh, it's not mostly doing things in the browser. The bulk of Glimmer's code is in its compiler. Um, our goal is both to reduce the amount of code sent to the browser as well as the amount of work it has to do once it gets there. So to accomplish that, we move as much as we can into the compilation step. So the Glimmer compiler takes in all of the components in your application at once. So uh, your application, any real application is going to have probably hundreds of components, but maybe at least dozens. Um, takes them all in, in all at once, parses them, and turns them into an executable program that will run in the browser building and updating your DOM. Um, so what kind of program does it turn them into? So for example, Babel turns JSX into JavaScript, and Svelte turns templates into JavaScript. Glimmer, on the other hand, compiles them into something called Glimmer bytecode. Uh, Glimmer bytecode is a binary format that efficiently, and I'll talk a little bit more later about why there's a difference between compiling into JavaScript and compiling into bytecode, why it's more than just a cool technical trick. Um, so Glimmer bytecode is a binary format that efficiently encodes DOM and component-related operations. So it's not uh, just a simple bytecode, like if you were going to take a Lisp class and write a Lisp bytecode. It's really a specialized VM, specialized bytecode that's designed for talking about uh, things that we do in the browser. Um, and here is uh, some, an example of a real-world template compiled into real-world opcodes. So what happens is this bytecode is executed on top of the Glimmer VM. It's a small runtime that's included with the application. Um, today, we got the, run the VM down to about 18 kilobytes with Brotly compression, but we're confident that we can get this down to at least 10K in the, in the near term. So today, the Glimmer runtime itself is very small. Uh, like I said, we have plans to make it even smaller, but the bigger deal than the, the templating engine being small is templates. Um, the templates themselves are very small over the wire, and in practice, if you look at real applications, templates or render functions in React um, they actually dominate app size. So if you look at an application, the vast majority of the code in your application is actually going to end up being those render functions or those templates. So wins in template size make a big difference. Um, so I've been talking a little bit about stuff we've been doing for the second version of the, of the template format, the binary template format. But the first version, which actually did less things even than I'm talking about here, got a pretty big win. Um, we shipped it in Ember, uh, I think, last year or earlier this year. Um, last year, it says 1 December. And uh, a lot of people reported that they got something like 50% um, improvements in their app size, total app size. So that basically illustrates how true it is that, there's so, that people's templates are such a big chunk of their application. Um, so that was, that was V1. We're actually doing more in V2. Um, and so V1, uh, so, so size, getting your templates smaller is nice. It means you have to download less things. But there's actually a bigger problem with downloading things than just downloading things over the network. There's also the time it takes to parse JavaScript in the browser. And you probably think, oh, like parsing, that seems like a small step. It's probably pretty quick. Um, but there's actually a really good blog post that Adi Osmani of Google did last year where he did an analysis of like what actually takes all the time when you're booting an application because the, uh, Google is really interested in trying to get people to reduce the amount of time. And what he found was that parse and compile take up a huge percentage of the total time. In some cases, they might even take up more time than the actual time it takes to execute the JavaScript in the first place, like in this example. Um, and mobile phones, uh, even like good mobile phones like the Pixel, uh, also take a huge amount of time. So this is um, 
This is a mobile phone with a slower CPU, and it takes something like uh, over a second, where the desktop takes about 200 milliseconds, and, and even faster phones take more than 200 milliseconds. So parse and compile could take multiple seconds, and since your target is seconds, this is really a huge amount of time. Um, this is basically something that all frameworks have seen. So Ember saw this a few years ago, but um, Sebastian, Mark Badge, who is on the core team, he's one of the main people who works on React, tweeted last year that parsing and compiling is a huge, huge problem, and he was talking about trying to get more, get them to talk about it more, and if you follow him, he's talked a lot about it. Um, so parsing and compiling, that's a huge problem for JavaScript frameworks. This is something that everyone saw. So um, remember, our goal is not just to make applications snappy once they're running, which is what JITs are good at. So the, you know, the JavaScript JIT, once you're running, it's great. Uh, JavaScript runs pretty fast. Um, but we also need to get content on the screen quickly, so we need to do something about parsing. And you might have guessed, based on what I've said so far, what the answer to our problem is, that, which is that we can use the compiler to do the work outside of the browser. So instead of doing the parsing and compiling inside the browser, what if we could do the parsing and compiling outside of the browser? And what does that mean? So I've talked a little bit about it, but I want to uh, go into a little more detail here. Um, so here, here's the template that we've been looking at so far. And I, I want to talk about what exactly it means, and then in a minute I'll show you a real-world demo. So um, first of all, anything that's like a string, so if we look at this uh, template, there's things like current weather, um, New York, New York, right? Anything that looks like a string gets stored in JSON. Um, JSON is much faster to parse than JavaScript for obvious reasons, and uh, more importantly, you can actually parse JSON off the main thread. So if you use a fetch and tell the browser that it's JSON, it actually does the parsing of the, of the JSON off the main thread. So there's no blocking at all waiting for the JSON. Um, and, but more, and that's, that's a, a chunk of, of stuff, but it's actually not the bulk of it. The bulk of it is the actual program, and the program itself is bytecodes. It's just a bunch of binary, and there's no parse of that at all. As soon as we get the bytes in the browser, we're ready to go, right? It's just, it's just a bunch of bytes in a buffer, and when, we, when, when we're going to render, we just jump to some place in the buffer and just start running the VM. So uh, what that means is that all these templates that in older versions of Ember and a lot of other frameworks are JavaScript, even Svelte, which you know, also boils away the runtime, compiles into JavaScript, all these templates don't actually have any parsing or any compile time at all because we compile them already into something that, um, that we can run on our own VM. So, uh, and like I said, that's the bulk of your application code. As soon as we have the bytes, we're ready to go. So let me show you a demo of what that looks like. Um, first, I'm gonna just show you, I'm gonna compare um, Glimmer to Preact. Now, as I said before, the Glimmer VM is 18K and Preact is 3K, so obviously we have a it's a little tricky for us to be competitive here. Um, so let me start. So this is basically, is it? There we go. So uh, what we did is we took a bunch of Wikipedia pages and, in, and turned them into components, and we're rendering them with the fast 3G profile with a 6X CPU slowdown. Um, this is approximately like a real device that I once had to work on. Um, in, in the real world, there actually is a lot of static content in applications, um, both in things like headers and footers, but also kind of sprinkled around everywhere. Um, so this is a nice test case of initial render. Um, also, if you have heard about Glimmer's like quote unquote static optimizations, they don't come into play here because we're just rendering the first time. So um, as you can see, Glimmer was very competitive with React. I think we barely uh, beat React, uh, Preact, I mean. Um, and again, the interesting, the surprising thing there is that we beat Preact even though we're quite a bit larger. Um, part of that has to do with what happens to the templates when you're, once you're actually running the real, the templates in the real world. Um, uh, I actually don't think, I think this is a repeat of exactly the same thing. I will wait just in case there's anything, there's some reason I put it here other than it's a repeat of the same thing. Nope, it's a repeat of the same thing, seems good. Um, so by the way, as I said, we chose Preact for this, um, stress test because it's very tiny which benefits initial render. Um, React itself actually uh, helps. So React doesn't win. Um, we're not using Preact as a cheat. Um, React itself still it loses because of its larger bulk. Um, but React is able to do some more smarts um, than Preact. But uh, for this stress test, we really wanted to focus on how fast we can get content on the screen, not what we can do once it's on the screen. And, and we did pretty well. So. Um, However, as we saw, initial render still took some time, um, and at this point, we're doing pretty simple operations. It's actually pretty hard for us to optimize much faster than this, because if you look at the profile, it's mostly bound by like, how fast you can create elements and set attributes, which is more or less the, the low-level operations. So um, we actually need to try to find a different approach. Uh, 
And the answer to the better, and, and it's worth noting, one of the issues with it taking 500 milliseconds to a second to two seconds is that while it's rendering, the user can't scroll. So even though you, kind of, you got through some amount, so in that case, there's like several screens of content, even though you got past the first screen of content, the user still can't look at it, they can't scroll, everything is blocked, waiting. Uh, and that's more or less how most uh, systems work. So what we wanted to do is what if we could actually start putting the content on the screen as fast as we have it, instead of waiting for the whole thing to finish. So here's another demo of what happens when we break the work into pieces. Um, it's exactly the same profile of phones, exactly the same applications. As you see, Glimmer was much faster. Um, and again, that's because we were able to emit the, uh, start, start putting content on the screen as fast as we were able to render it instead of waiting for it to finish. Um, in this case, uh, we get the best of both worlds. So exactly what does it mean that we broke up the work? Uh, you might think, oh, breaking up the work, that seems like an obvious thing. You would want to do it, so clearly anybody can do it. Um, the reason that Glimmer is able to do it is that we, broke, we already broke up all the work into opcodes. So uh, here's some example opcodes that we might be running. These particular ones do not take 100 milliseconds, but if you have a lot of them, they will. Um, so Normally, we would, act, like before this most recent change, we would execute all the opcodes synchronously, wait till you finish, and we're done. Um, similarly, like React or Preact or any of these systems, they run the render functions, they keep running the render functions recursively until you get to the end, then once they built up the whole virtual DOM, then they start putting the virtual DOM into the DOM, right? So similar story, you run the whole program, when you're done, you put stuff in the DOM. Um, but actually, we can do better. Um, because it's just a flat list of bytecodes, it's not like a nested structure we have to understand, um, we can use deadlines provided by the browser. So request idle callback is this new feature that the browser provided that allows us to uh, know how much time we have before the browser needs to let the user scroll, basically, which is approximately 16 milliseconds. Um, and what we can do is we can slice up those opcodes. Again, these, are, these do not take that long, but many of them do. Um, we can, we can do that, uh, so we can slice it up into pieces. Um, notably, we can do that with the existing bytecode and the existing VM. The existing VM already allowed you to control the timing of the bytecode execution. We just didn't do anything with that um, yet. Uh, but in Glimmer 0.9, which is gonna be released as a canary this week sometime, um, this particular slicing is built in. So if you have a big page, uh, we'll, as of Glimmer 0.9, we'll start putting things on the screen as soon as we have them available. Um, I also, I should mention, um, Fiber in React is helpful here. Uh, like Fiber helps them to do things that are somewhat like this. Uh, the cost of Fiber though is that there's a bigger runtime, right? So there's always this push and pull where you can get very, very tiny runtime like Preact, but you don't have any smarts at all. Um, or you can uh, get the much more robust runtime when you're dealing with JavaScript like React, and then you have to deal with however long it takes to download, run, uh, parse, and execute that much JavaScript. Um, I actually didn't get a chance to talk about a lot of other important features that Glimmer VM provides. For example, I didn't talk about updating at all. Um, so one, the way that we keep things responsive is by having the initial render emit a much smaller updating program, um, which we can run whenever we want to update the DOM without having to do something like walk an entire tree of virtual DOM. So instead of walking a tree, comparing trees, reconciling, whatever, um, the initial rendering program just emits a second program that we run, second program emits a third program that we run, et cetera, whenever we want to update something. Um, and the consequence of that is that we don't have to actually allocate, we don't have to create anything whenever we're looking to update something. Um, that also leans on all the compilation architecture to make it um, efficient. Uh, we also have had for a while now server-side rendering and rehydration built into the VM. So server-side rendering means you can render uh, Glimmer, that's because we don't use the DOM internally, we use a subset and we have a server implementation. And rehydration means we can take something that the server provided and rehydrate it. Um, we do cool stuff like uh, repairing rehydrate, so even if there's small mistakes, we'll fix them. Um, that can happen because like your internationalization library in V8 is different from Edge's internationalization library or something. Um, and uh, zero, Glimmer 0 0.9 adds the two bullets at the bottom, which are uh, streaming server-side rendering. And you, you can sort of imagine how this can work, right? Because it's a bunch of opcodes, whenever we reach certain opcodes like flush element, that's an appropriate time for us to do streaming. We can build that in. Um, and incremental rehydration basically means that we can, uh, so if you're rehydrating a bunch of DOM, let's say you have you know, many screens, if you stop rehydrate the whole thing by running the whole program again, what's gonna happen is the user's not gonna be able to scroll while you're in the middle of rehydrating. And incremental rehydration basically um, will rehydrate just a chunk of the DOM, that uh, a chunk at a time in the same kind of manner as the previous slide, the incremental 
slide, um, but against DOM that already existed, right? Which means that the user can start scrolling right away, and behind the scenes will start um, enhancing it with behavior. And both of those things are coming in 0 0.9, which is going to be released this week. Um, if you want to play with Glimmer, the easiest way to do that is uh, the Glimmer Playground, which is glimmerplayground.netlify.com. Um, there's an Easter egg for people who watch the 90s movie The Net. There's a pi sign on the bottom, and it will show you the opcodes for whatever thing you typed in. Um, if you like the Playground, if you played around with it and you want, like it, um, check out glimmerjs.com, which is basically the, the library. Um, and just want, I want to close by saying, um, by using a compiler and a VM architecture to boil away runtime costs, we actually do succeed at the original goal that we talked about, which is to get content on the screen quickly without conceding amb ambitious applications to our native brethren. So what I will say is let's expand our point of view. Uh, compiling away the runtime lets us build ambitious applications that don't compromise on what Alex said was the web superpower, getting content to anyone who has a computing device in a matter of seconds. Thank you very much. I think I have time for questions. Plenty. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, general. So the question is debugging. Um, there's a few things I would say about that. First of all, in general. Um, the more abstract we get, the more risky that is, and I think that we take that pretty seriously 